Okie dokie, I believe we are all the way live. Hello and welcome to My Graveyard. I'm your host of the evening, the Cemetery Man from Salem, Mass. Always taking names and kicking candy ass. Live in the color here with you on Grande's Graveyard. And welcome back to another edition of the show. And tonight, it's time for some Yuletide terror, ladies and gents, because it's the Christmas horror special, ladies and gents, where we have not one, not two, but three Christmas horror tales and absolutely zero regrets, but we have one of something else, one of something that I've been holding off all December season. It's a Grande's Graveyard December staple. It is none other than eggnog time, yo. Let's get it. Yeah, eggnog tonight on Grande's Graveyard. I've got a little cup here. We got a red solo cup. We're going to be pouring this son of a bitch. I don't know what y'all are drinking, but tonight, I, I, this is the first time ever, I believe, because last year on the graveyard, I did get a Stu Leonard's, but I got a regular. This time I went light. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of just trying to stay light. I don't know if it's, you know, going to taste the same. I'm hoping it tastes the same, but, you know, it is what it is. I already had someone at work try a glass, so it is opened. Um, I bought this fresh out of the store today, and I figured, hell yeah, it's Grande's Graveyard tonight. And it wouldn't be a December edition of Grande's Graveyard without a little bit of eggnog in the house. So, everybody, I'm going to pour myself a nice little glass of this as we take the cap off here and we're gonna oh yeah oh this is some thick nog i see a bunch of goddamn nutmeg in this son of a bitch too so let me let me put the cap on this son of a bitch and we are going to have a little bit of eggnog tonight i don't know what y'all are drinking but if you want to tell me down below feel free chars chars eggnog chars ladies and gents Oh, man, that's a good nog. It is. I, I understand why it's lighter. It doesn't taste, I wouldn't say diluted, but it's not as, it's not too sweet, not too strong. I think it's just right. I, I kind of like this. So cheers, everybody. I don't know if anyone else is having the eggnog chars tonight, but eggnog chars to everybody. Hmm. Okay, we'll save a little bit for the show. In between films, maybe. Um. Oh, it seems like my camera lost a little bit of focus. That's not good. Let's see if we can get it back into focus. Yeah, I think that worked. Okay, sorry about that. We got comments to get to. Miss Carter was in the air before we even went live. Ciao, Grande, and season's greetings, everybody. Yes, hell yeah. Happy, happy Christmas season time. Slasher Fred says happy holidays. Welcome, my friend. Hope all is well with you. Fever Dreamlight Theater, Anthony's in the house. Hey, hey, happy holidays. Anthony is going to be uploading some Christmas gifts come early. He's going to be ranking the creep show segments. I believe that is the first two films. I hope you're not including the third film because that's better left forgotten. That's I'm looking forward to that. He's reviewing the grave with Lee Marvin twilight zone episode. And last but not least, I believe he's reviewing the time element. I saw it just before I went live. I swear to you, Anthony, I commented not 10 minutes ago on you posted a little uh, comment on the, on the thread on the community tab. And I saw that was coming. And I said, dude, this is Christmas come early because Anthony's content's great. And he's hitting us with three goddamn things. It's almost like Ronnie's graver time. We've got three movies to discuss. Love eggnog chars. Chars to you too, buddy. Ciao, Grande. I love the impression that is going to be a silent, but deadly night. Hell yeah. We, it's funny. I got three Christmas horror films, but none of them killer Santa movies. But that's, I guess, the, the staple, right? That don't open until Christmas, the Silent Night, Deadly Nights of the World, some ways Christmas Evil. But, you know, I've actually covered almost all of those movies. I did do Christmas Evil. I have done a, a Silent Night, Deadly Night retrospective. I've, I've covered a lot of the Killer Santa movies. So tonight I figure we discuss three that are not killer santa movies which is kind of exciting and i'm super stoked to get to these what's up brother dude ryan snyder's in the house what's going on good brother cheers to you my friend sean blue digital what's up what's up good brother sean hope all is well with you too hey slash your friend mateo people saying hi currently watching dude i watched it i'm assuming you got the the three pack i've got it in my room otherwise i'd show it up of silent night daily night three four and five on blu-ray that vestron put out Awesome, awesome little addition. Now, I am not a huge fan of Silent Night, Deadly Night 3 or 4, but I love Silent Night, Deadly Night 5, the toy maker. Mickey Rooney and Pino and that and Martin Kittresser, who was the script supervisor for Quentin Tarantino and stuff like I love the fifth one. That of the sequels after part two to me is the only good one. Like I love part five. I think it's great. And they had some awesome features on that disc, on each disc. You know, they interviewed the executive producer for all three. 
they got interviews with the kid who played Pino and he told some funny Mickey Rooney stories and they actually got Bill Mosley to discuss part three, even though it's a piece of shit movie. It was kind of interesting to hear Bill Mosley's thoughts on it. I thought it was an excellent addition. You can go to your local Best Buy and get it for eleven ninety nine. That is the gift that just keeps on giving the whole way to quote legendary uncle Eddie from Christmas vacation. But yeah, no, I love, I love that edition. I thought it was really cool. I watched part five in its entirety and I watched all the features on the other two. I haven't gotten to three or four yet. I do have the VHS, I believe of part three. Yeah. It's right over there. I can see it. I have the VHS of part three, which it is a, that's a stinker, but you know, it is what it is. Another killer Santa movie is called to all a good night. I covered that one too. I did that one alongside Christmas Evil not too long ago. So I've done I've done a lot of the Killer Santa movies already, and that's why tonight we're not doing Killer Santa. Nothing spectacular. Diet due tonight, but tastes super good. Been sick, so my first one after four days without. Oh, my gosh. Well, I hope you feel better, Miss C. Uh, cheers to you. Diet due. I can't lie to you. I can't do Diet due. I've tried it twice, and I thought it was awful both times. And I'm a big Mountain Dew aficionado. I don't know. Maybe I'm better stick with the light eggnog as opposed to a Diet due, but that's just me. But tonight... We're getting into three Christmas horror movies, ladies and gents. First, it's going to be from the year 2015. It is Krampus. Second, from the year 1999. This one I actually own. This is Desecration from Dante Tomaselli. And finally, from this year, 2022. Yes, this is a new movie. Very rare I review new movies on Granny's Graveyard, but it is from, I believe it's director Eric Pennykoff. This is The Leech from the year 2022. So we'll end the show around round out things with that. And we're going to go, of course, mainstream movie and then two independent ones. Three movies, no regrets on Grande's Greer tonight. Happy to have you all in the house. And I hope to dedicate you if these some of these are movies you haven't heard of. We really need a Blu-ray release for Elves 1989. I would have to agree with that. That's a very fun movie. I'm surprised they haven't. I would think like a Vinegar Central could get their hands on that. And do that. that. That's surprising. Instead, I think they did Don't Open Till Christmas, which I don't think is a good movie at all. They, they did good artwork for it, good cover art, but you know, the movie, I don't know. Elvis is a lot better, I would say. Christmas Evil has an appearance by a very young Patricia Richardson, who is known for playing Bill Ch Jill Taylor on Home Improvement. I love Christmas Evil. Gotta be in my top three, probably my top three Christmas horror movies of all time. I love it. John, John Waters is favorite. I think the lead actor, Brandon McGarth, literally like it's one of those performances where the actor is lost in the role. Like it, 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 you watch that and it's not Brandon McGarth. It's Santa Claus. Like he becomes Santa Claus before your eyes. That's why I love that movie. I think it's the acting performance from McGarth is just incredible. Um, your opinion is Die Hard a Christmas movie. I would say hell yeah, but I know that's a very big, like debated topic. I don't know. I know. I never understood the controversy with that. Like why do so many people argue about that? I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I mean, Kippy Kaye. I, I love Die Hard. I think Die Hard One and Two are fantastic movies. I would say yes, but don't shoot me if you disagree. I don't know. But a lot of people like get angry about that. Are you going to watch Christmas Bloody Christmas or Violent Night if you haven't seen them already? Violent Night did not intrigue me at all. I, I'm really sick to death of fucking just movies that are just they're just sold on their violence. Like, I'm kind of burnt out. And fun fact: Christmas Bloody Christmas. Now, this is going to be a shocker. The Leech and Christmas Bloody Christmas had a lot of the same people involved. And The Leech we're going to be reviewing tonight, Christmas Bloody Christmas, I'm not. The Leech and Christmas Bloody Christmas both have Jeremy Gardner in them as, as one of the actors. And I believe similar producers, so definitely like the same people, similar people. And I found The Leech far more intriguing on paper. So that's why I picked that one to be the new movie I review. So I lean towards The Leech and um, I will definitely give it a review tonight and see if, you know, it interests you. I believe that's a, a robotic Killer Santa, which I don't know. Again, it didn't. The Killer Santa thing this year, I don't know. It just kind of fizzled out. I was like, you know, I want to do some different ones, ones that people don't talk about as much. So. You know, it is what it is. Don't open till Christmas has solid kills, but everything else is pretty all over the place. I would agree with that. It's not like it's not the worst movie in the world, but it, I would not say it's a great Christmas horror movie at all. It's just kind of one of the shuffle. But let's get into one that most people really thoroughly enjoy. Most people put over. Will I be in the same ballpark, ladies and gents? That is the question on Grande's Graveyard here tonight. And without further ado, it is from director. I always kind of box this guy's name, Michael. Darty Daughtry? I don't know how to pronounce his name, but this, this is 
Krampus. Yes, Krampus from 2015. Now I do brief plot synopsis as always. Let me go back. A boy who has a bad Christmas accidentally summons a festive demon to his family home. Yes, Krampus from 2015. Now, getting into a little bit of the backstory before we get into the movie itself here. Krampus was in a lot of ways a very big release movie at the time because Christmas horror does not sell very well. It's one of those things where investors are scared to put their money behind it. They're scared to put it in theaters because they don't want another Silent Night, Deadly Night, 1984, where the parents are riding with picket signs and, oh, Santa can't be a killer. And, and this is a good time of the year for cheer and eggnog and gifts and joy and wonder. Why, just why would you throw horror on top of that? You horrible producers, actors, writers, directors, etc. How could you do such a thing? How could you turn, you know, such a... a Deering, you know, like joyous holiday and turn horror, turn it horrific. Why would you do such a thing? And, you know, in 1984, that was the case. In 2006, when the Black Christmas remake came out, that was a big reason, a big deal. A lot of people were very up in arms about that. And from that time, from the year 2006, it was not nine years later until we got another Christmas horror film that was released worldwide and Krampus is that film now it's directed by Michael Daughtry who of course and I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing his name I really I'm not sure if, how to pronounce it he had directed a little movie called Trick or Treat which is the infamous you know um anthology horror film with you know Sam and and all this the Halloween segments and it was it was infamously of course Warner Brothers didn't think much of it they didn't release it theatrically and then the movie became the highest selling DVD on I think the year that it came out I think 2007 is when the DVD released and it's one of those things where it became this huge cult classic and now everywhere you go you see Sam and you see oh, I'm trying to I'll try to focus this camera again sorry it keeps like unfocusing me I don't know this is weird well this is not working. I don't know. Well, I guess we'll do small screen for now because this, this camera is having a hell of a night. But, of course, that movie became a big cult horror icon. You cannot go to your spirit Halloweens and stuff like that now without seeing Sam. And, you know, I think what happened is the studios are thinking, hey, man, this guy did a cult Halloween movie that people have gone on to kind of put over as one of the best Halloween horror movies. Let's give this guy another holiday. Let's give him Christmas and let's see if he could take the ball and he can run with it. And now Krampus was released, I believe, early December of the year 2015, worldwide release. It did pretty well in theaters. I believe it had a budget of about $15 million, grossed about 61 And usually they say your money times two is when you make a profit. So this did twice that. It did it twice its money times two. So it did quite well. But where do I stand on Krampus? Where do I stand on this movie? Now, this is an interesting, again, I'm going to try to fix this camera here. Let's try to fix it. Oh, geez. I don't know. This is so weird. I don't get why. See, I don't want to be all blurry the whole goddamn show. I guess I could unplug and replug my camera. Jeez. I don't know, ladies and gents. Hold on. Let's 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 put it on standby here because I'm gonna remove myself. I'll be right back. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know. My 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 thing is completely like was blurry and shit when I tried to share the screen. So I apologize. Let me get the comments though before I get into my thoughts on the film. Uh, I think we were here. Krampus looks so good in 4K too, and I know that 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 cut is very controversial because it's called the naughty cut, right? And it's not very naughty. It's really, there's no violence or gore or anything else really added to it. There's an extra F word. I know that. And there's a lot of like extended dialogue scenes. That's that's about the extent of the naughty cut. But I will say this, that 4K does sound really good. This, the sound design of this movie is actually the best thing in it. If you have speakers, if you have soundbar, if you have a subwoofer and you watch this movie with that stuff, it's really, it heightens the experience for sure. The Black Christmas remake works very well and it's gotten better with age. It's one of those men where it's like, 
I don't hate it like most people. It's so over the top that it's like almost kind of dumb fun. But you can see that movie was just meddled with. Like the producers, met, that was a wine scene movie where they just could not keep their fingers out of the cookie jar. And it's a shame. I know the director has said that he's not proud of the film, which is a shame because I like Glenn Morgan. Um, I don't know. It's one of those movies where, again, I'm iffy. I'm kind of middle of the road. I The original, I think, is great. It, but trust me, it's better than the 2019. The 2019 one makes the 06 one look like Citizen Kane. Agreed, Sean Donald opens until Christmas does have some good kills, as I recall. I think what makes the Christmas horror movies so iconic is that it takes what is supposed to be the happiest time of the year and turns it into a nightmare. Yes, that dynamic I love personally as a horror fan, right? Like, I love the whole dynamic of good and, and happiness and, and nothing evil and then throwing everything evil at it to kind of mixing the two together. It's the polar opposites. To me, they somehow attract. That's why I am attracted to Christmas horror as well. I love Christmas horror. Terminator is what I call a Christmas is Terminator is what I call Christmas bloody Christmas. I super disappointed with silent with violent night. Yeah. I just, I don't know. It's one of those. I saw the trailer. I was like, I'm not interested. What Slash Fred said, come back, it's fixed. Sorry about that. I did not mind Krampus, but every movie that the actor that is Todd Packer from The Office, I can't take seriously. Yeah, no, for real, for real. Uh, uh, Triple M's in the house. What's up, Grani? Loving the hat. Thank you, brother. Thank you. We're drinking eggnog tonight. Eggnog chars, brother. Eggnog chars. Um, everyone's saying hi. Now, my thoughts on Krampus. I saw this in the movies, saw this in the theater opening night, and I did a poll, actually, this past week on Instagram, and I asked people what they thought of the film. Great, good, disappointing, or bad. Now, I don't vote on my own shit, but if I had to vote, if I if it was I could vote, and this is, I guess, my my airing my vote, I find the film disappointing. I do find this movie disappointing, and for a multitude of reasons. But I do not think it's a piece of shit. I don't think it's bad. I think it's a tr your traditional classic mixed bag. I think there's a lot to like and a lot to dislike in this movie. That's kind of where I stand with it. I'll get into it first. The movie opens up and it sort of starts off like a comedy in along the vein of like a Christmas vacation, right? You're introduced to this family, Tony Collette, of course. Um, what's his damn name? Adam. Oh my God. What the hell is his damn name? Fucking Adam Scott, of course, from Step Brothers. Everyone remembers from Step Brothers. And of course, uh, horror fans from Hellraiser 4 Bloodline, which is better left forgotten. Adam Scott and, of course, the two kids. And then, of course, their family comes over. One of them is the guy from The Office. What's his damn name? David Koshner. David Koshner, he comes over. And the first, like, I would say 20, 25 minutes of this is really, like, in my opinion, like a bad version of Christmas Vacation, right? We're introduced to these family members that are everything but perfect, and all of them are kind of colorful in what they have to say. There's the lady from Two and a Half Men who is the fucking nanny, or or I guess I guess the maid or, or whatever the fuck, the chef, whatever, in Two and a Half Men. I notice her in there. You I feel like it's a it's one of those movies that gets off on the wrong foot. Like it's trying to make fun of the holiday. Right. Like it's trying to be like the opening. It's Black Friday and everyone's trampling each other. Oh, OK, I get it. I get your commentary on Black Friday and how it becomes kind of like rampant like that in the stores. I get that. These people are kind of all awful at the dinner table. There's this kind of thing that escalates with the son. And he had written a letter to Santa because he still believes in the purity of Christmas. Of course, his two cousins kind of make fun of him in front of everybody. And then he basically says, you know, I hate you. I hate Christmas. I hate everybody. He storms up to his room and takes the letter to Santa and kind of just throws it out the window. And thus inadvertently kind of summoning the Christmas horror demon known as Krampus. And Krampus, I guess, comes to get them one by one with the help of his toy and cookie demons. Okay, let's do positives first. This is a mixed bag for me. I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to piss people off because I know most people like this movie. When I did the poll, almost half the people voted good or great. I think actually more than half voted good or great. So good on you if you like this movie. You think it's a Christmas classic masterpiece. Let's do let's do things I do like about the movie. Like I said before, sound design, excellent stuff. When you hear the footsteps of Krampus, you know, when the sister kind of goes out in the blizzard and she's kind of trying to go to her boyfriend's house, you hear the, the hooves and the footsteps. And when he leaps off the house and hits the ground, that's some great stuff. That is horrifying. That's good stuff. It's some of the few good horror sequences in this horror movie, in my opinion. That's a good scene. I like that. The actors are okay, 
but their characters are very bland. And I know that it's the kind of the point where we're not supposed to like them. They are imperfect. They are obnoxious, similar vein to the Randy Quaid character in Christmas Vacation, like Cousin Eddie. But the thing is, Cousin Eddie was funny. Cousin Eddie, even though, you know, he has a little brain, Clark Griswold says it best, his heart is bigger than his brain. He had a, he had heart to him, at least. As dumb as he is, as stupid as he was, as much of a, a leech, for lack of a better term, for tonight's show, we're talking about the leech later, as he was, he, he, he had a charm to him, right? I don't feel any of these characters in this house have a charm to him. Although the acting is fine, I don't see any real charm with the, the performances. I, I just don't. Or the characters themselves. I don't think the actors do a bad job. The idea of it is really good. It's a very good moral idea where Christmas has become about gifts and all of these people being ungrateful at the time where they should be most grateful. I get that. I get the the whole social commentary that it's trying to have on the holiday where it's become something kind of completely different than what it's meant to be, what it's supposed to be. I get that. And I think it's all done pretty well here. It's smart. But, you know, and and I will say one more thing. The puppetry, all the puppetry done in here, there is some CGI, but the puppetry stuff is very well done. I like all of that stuff as well. But to me, man, this movie is kind of all over the place when it comes to tone. And Mateo was saying it, it's hard to take David Koshner seriously. Yeah, there's some scenes in this movie where I find where it's like, man, I feel like this. some of this is goofy, right? Like there's the scenes where the toys and the gingerbread men are attacking the family and it's kind of goofy. You don't really feel that it's threatening. At least I didn't. Some people were afraid of the jack-in-the-box thing that eats one of the, the cousins. I don't know. I didn't find that really scary, personally. I, I, I think that's a big the big miss for me is the horror here. I don't find the film scary at all. I don't feel it like it's unsettling in any way. There's a scene where the, one of the kids, he's this fat kid. They lower down this gingerbread cookie. And he starts eating it and the thing kind of wraps around and pulls him back up. And it's supposed to be horrifying. Again, it, the whole sequence is kind of just kind of flat. I don't know. It didn't it didn't really do much for me personally. That that stuff really doesn't work. Um, and to me, that's a big issue in this movie where it's Christmas and horror. Granted, there's some comedy. The comedy kind of falls flat. The horror kind of falls flat. I don't know. It's just, it's just a mixed bag. There's so much to, to kind of go on here. But let's get back to comments. Let's see. I think we were here. Yeah, big cast in Krampus and a guy from Anchorman. Yes, exactly. Last year, I was trying to find Krampus 2015. Holy crap, there's a mother load of Krampus movies. Yes, and then a lot of bad directed dvd ones. Um, the original Gremlins is definitely a horror Christmas movie. You have this teenager who is given this new pet and these rules of taking care of it. Uh, but then he takes care of the rule, takes the rules for granted. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Gremlins is a classic. I watched it a few nights ago. Oh, I of course. Gremlins is great. It's how Krampus looked that bothered me. He has like a hollowed out Santa face. Yeah. No, from what I've read in my research for this, they put a, it's a Santa mask. They, they fully acknowledge it's a Santa mask because they wanted you to come up with what Krampus looks like underneath. I, I think that's kind of weak. I, I I don't know. I don't. I just think that's sort of weak. I, I don't like it. The, the the effect is good. It's not all CG. I like some of the puppetry. I do think that stuff is good. And the elves, like the practical stuff in it, is well done. There's a little too much CG here and there, but for the most part, the puppetry works. The story and all through the house. Oh, of course. I did that last year. That's a great one. Tom is here. I wanted to like Krampus. I'm the same way. Saw it in the theater, watched it on a streaming service, but never really connected to it. Not funny enough, not scary enough, just okay. I would completely agree with that. It's like, I want to. I remember going to the theater being very optimistic. Like, oh my God, is this the next trick or treat? This guy, you know, he made a... a groundbreaking horror film with with trick or treat is this going to be maybe it was hype maybe it was the hype that killed it i don't know maybe i don't know i don't know what it was more like krampus got him mark mark's in the house mark welcome to my graveyard my friend my my guest from last week i'm kind of right on the the way with tom now now okay i don't want to be all negative here i do think there's a couple decent sequences in the film there's a sequence where they have this grandmother and she's telling the story of how she once encountered Krampus as a child. Right. And what I love what they did was instead of doing like a flashback and it's, it's, you know, live action, they do a flashback and it's almost like claymation. I'm not sure what it's 3d animation of some sort, but it's really different and unique looking. I thought it was wonderfully done here. I wanted to put that over that sequence to me is better than the entire movie itself. Like, I love that sequence where the grandmother's telling the story of how 
her parents were fighting when she was a kid and she did the same thing. She kind of threw her Christmas cheer and joy out the window and then Krampus came, murdered her entire family and kind of left her with like an ornament that said Krampus on it as she kind of woke up the next day and saw the tree destroyed, all the presents and gifts and, and bows and ribbons and all that shit destroyed on the floor and her family had been taken away. And you see the, the kind of heartbreak and sorrow on her face as she tells that story. I thought that was great. I really did. I almost wish that was in a better movie. I really do. And in a lot of ways, I think wouldn't have been really different to make the entire movie like that. All the entire movie, 3D animation, claymation, like just a different aesthetic and vibe to the whole thing. The entire movie like that. That would have been something really cool to see for me. I would have really liked that change of pace. Because I know how many live action Christmas horror movies do we have? A ton of them. But how many, you know, 3D animation horror Christmas movies do we have? Not many. Not many that I could think of, right? I think that would have been a really bold choice, a really unique direction to take it. And I thought that sequence was really well done. But again, after she tells the story, there's like a lame joke. David Koshner makes a joke. He's like, oh, I'm not going to believe shit from this old hag. Like, what? Like... You just ruined the, the vibe in the room. She sells Krampus. She sells the legend and the lore. And then he kind of just ruins it with a like kind of offhand joke. I'm like, eh, I don't know. I don't really, I didn't feel that joke belonged in there. I would have cut that right out. And, and you know, going back to what the, the horror of this movie, a lot of the horror in it is not really Krampus. A lot of it is more his minions, the toys, right? There's the evil gingerbread men who go off against David Koshner. I guess it's tongue in cheek. I guess some people might find it funny. I don't know. I didn't really laugh at that. There's the attic sequence where the Jack in the box and all these kind of killer dolls, which at that point I'm like, I feel like I'm watching a different film, right? Like it's weird. Like these killer dolls really. And this one lady, she's like, Oh, uh, I'm, I'm going to blow the fudge out of you. Instead of saying, I'll blow the fuck out of you, whatever, I guess, you know, it's a PG. This is one of those horror movies where it was PG 13 released but it's trying everything to do to be an R. And then that's why when I thought the naughty cut came out, I was like, oh man, this is exactly what I want to see an R rated cut of this movie. Maybe, maybe just, maybe it's more violent, you know, more cursing, less comedy. I was thinking I was going to get that. You only get one more F word. That's really all it. You don't get any more violence or, you know, more Krampus, more this, more that. You really kind of just get more extended dialogue scenes. So it's not a naughty cut. I think it's something they just used to sell the movie. Um, and that's, I mean, that's fine. If you want to sell a special edition 4k of it, it, it's fine. But I don't know at the end of the day that that's kind of false advertising. There's nothing really naughty about that cut. I don't know. There's, and then I guess the elephant in the room is really the ending, right? The ending where all of them get picked off. There's some of them like Adam Scott tries to have this heroic moment where he saves them. They do start to warm up to each other. It seems like they're learning that, Oh, we shouldn't fight even though of all of our differences and all that stuff. I, there is a little bit of character development in there, but again, nothing that to run home about. It feels like a lot of them don't have much to do. Tony Collette doesn't have much to do. Adam Scott doesn't have much to do. They're just all kind of there. They get picked off one by one until it's finally down to the kid and they're throwing his cousin into this pit of fire and the kid runs up to Krampus and says, I take it all back. I take it all back. I learned my lesson. I'm sorry. You know, let them go. And you, you know, you realize, okay, he's, he realized his mistake. Then Krampus takes him and throws him in the pit. And I personally think the movie should have ended there. Like perfect ending. Don't touch it. And then they go to the next morning where the kid wakes up. Oh, was it all a dream? He goes downstairs everybody's being extra nice to each other. They're opening the gifts. No one's mentioned what anything of what we just saw until the kid opens up the, the Krampus ornament. And he kind of looks up. Everyone starts looking nervously around and they rip off Jeepers Creepers of all fucking movies where they pan out of the house. And you can see it's a layer, an evil person's layer, a camera shot zooming out. And of course, he's watching them. There's a song playing on the fucking record, not Jeepers Creepers, but there's a song playing on a record as we kind of zoom out, you know, get our final shot of Krampus and then his, his helpers and we kind of fade to black. What? Like, what the hell? I The ending is so weird to me and, and not in a good way. 
Like, it's one thing, okay, you're cl- blatantly, like, somebody just said, oh, fuck, Jeepers Creepers, fuck. Like, let's put that here and just do the exact same shot. And I know people have argued, like, oh, okay, th- th- at least it has a lot to say, though, right? What it's saying, though, com- in my opinion, contradicts everything. Okay, they all survived. This kid fucked up. They all survived. He learned from his lesson. Is that his character arc? That he all they all survive, but they're being watched over, and they better be nice, not naughty, because Krampus is watching them. And if you know they do bad again, if they start acting like assholes again, Krampus will come and make everything that that happened in the fictitious fictitious world happen as a reality. I get that part of it, but to me, it's like okay, the grandmother lost everything. That motherfucker ran in her house, murdered her family, stole all of her gifts, and she suffered the entire rest of her life for that. Why did she have to suffer the entire rest of her life for that? Where this motherfucking kid comes up, oh, I'm sorry, I, I take it back, I take it back. He gets thrown into the pit, and then the next word's like, oh, everyone's spared because you you admitted you fucked up. Is that really what they're trying to say? That he admitted he fucked up and she didn't? Like, she knew she fucked up, man. Like, okay, if you're going to give this kid a second chance, you might as well have given the old broad a second chance. What did she, like, goddamn, her parents were fighting, and she was upset, which, like, any kid would have been. And she she doesn't get the second redemption arc? This kid does, though? I thought that was really lame. I really did. I don't, I feel like the film is so contradicting itself there. She got fucked over, but this kid gets a second chance, but we are all we all have to be mindful of Krampus. Really? That's weak. That's just a weak ending to me. And I don't think there's enough Krampus in your Krampus movie. I think you get way more of the gingerbread men. You get way more of the demonic toys. I I feel like that stuff is just it should have been it should have been playing second fiddle to a Krampus. Like when that I told I'm telling you guys, the sequence of the girl going out in the snow. And you see Krampus on the the roof and he leaps up. That's the best horror sequence in this movie. That's scary. The sound design is good. It's tense. Holy shit. You don't exactly see what happens to her. But that got the ball rolling. And then ultimately the ball stops like right after that. I feel like the horror, the comedy, all that stuff just kind of takes a really abrupt halt. And I don't know. I just kind of feel like this one falls a little bit flat for me. I don't know. It it just kind of is what it is. Imagine this from Henry uh, Selleck. Well, I mean, we could. I think I was hoping Krampus would be more like Trick or Treat, a Christmas anthology with Krampus being the Crypt Keeper type character. I, you know, I don't know if, if what you had here really needed much change as opposed to maybe the tone for me. Like, that's the big problem for me. I really think it should have been more of a horror film right? Like that's, I think my big issue, but again, I don't know if other than that one scene, I don't know if the horror in it is very good at all. I, I don't know. Like, I don't know what I would have done to, to change this. I think like, I, I won't say this, the ambitious, the, the ambition, the moral, the message, all that stuff is good. I like that. I could see it came from someone who cared. I could see it came from someone who, you know, really wanted to say something about the holiday and, and people around the holiday and how it's lost its meaning. I get all that. That stuff is fine. And But there's a lot of Christmas movies with that shit. And let's be honest. I just feel like you're right. Like, just it really tonally, it's all over the place. It's just not, it doesn't have enough energy to it. It's kind of just flat. Uh, Nate's here. Nate, Defraud Awesome is happy birthday, my friend. Nate, happy birthday. One of my best friends in the world. How's it going, y'all? Dude, happy 23rd to you, my friend. One of the few people on here I know that's younger than me. Uh, if, if only by a year or two. Uh, another Christmas horror movie is Jack Frost with not the one with Michael Keaton and the late Kelly Preston. I love the one with Michael Keaton and Kelly Preston, but yeah, that's uh, the, I've never done that one. Never done mutant killer snowman movie. Very true. You really don't see him to the end. You ever, you ever see a Christmas horror story. That's a cool looking Krampus. I haven't. No, I would love to see that though, because I don't know. I just like, I don't know if a little bit more Krampus, right? Like, cause they start with him. And they finish with him. And then everything else in the middle is the fucking toys or the elves or the gingerbread cookies. The CGI gingerbread cookies, which really lost me. I thought that was silly in a bad way. I really didn't like that stuff. I don't know. I It's a mixed bag for me, man. I really like there, there's part of me. I kind of agree with people. Is I wanted to like it. I wanted to walk out of the theater and go, oh, that's the next, you know, Christmas great horror movie. And there are some people that think that. Some people I've, I've talked to think it's a masterpiece. Think it's like the best Christmas horror movie since black Christmas. 
I don't know, man. I'm not in that boat. I'm just not. I'm kind of just iffy on this one at best. I think it's not good. It's not bad. It's really the, the way I define it is disappointing. I think it's a disappointing movie. I think it's a movie that had potential to be a great movie, but it ultimately really doesn't capture in a lot of the ways that I think it could have. So crap is for me. It's a mixed bag, man. I'm going to have to come in. Let's do, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to be right in the middle here. I'm going to go 5 out of 10. I think this is a mixed bag, so we're going to get the mixed rating. 5 out of 10 for me. I think, you know, like I said, sound design, practical effects, moral message themes, stuff is good. The comedy isn't funny. The horror isn't really that scary aside from one scene. The ending, I think, is a total cop-out. I've always felt that way. I, I remember actually years ago, this is this is sort of a Grande's Graveyard anecdote. When I, This is back before I really did the show in this format. I would go to the movies and just review the movie after straight out of the movie. And I, I didn't put the movie over. I, I said, I didn't like the ending, you know, not much has changed since that initial viewing that was seven years ago. And I, this is the first time I rewatched it since. Um, I remember getting really mean comments when I reviewed this movie, like to the point where I took it down. That's how bad, I mean, the people you're a dumb fuck, fuck you. You don't know shit. Like meanest comments I ever got on a video. I was like, wow. I was like, I really struck a nerve here. So if anyone watches this and you do disagree, I apologize. I will. Um, but you know, please let's keep things civil here. Uh, there's going to be a horror version of how the Grinch stole Christmas coming out. Uh, not when I would buy on Blu-ray. No, me neither. Me, I don't own the movie. I watched it, uh, streaming somewhere and that, I don't know. Uh, that's fair ground. I wasn't really in love with Krampus either. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's middle of the road, man. It is. Uh, I think the one you're talking about is the mean one. That's starring the guy that plays, the guy that plays Terrifier. That's, I think it's in theaters. Actually, not too far from me, but, but, you know, that's what it is. Thanks so much for the wishes, John. Dude, anytime, man. I don't know if you're going live later, but I'll be there if you do. Um, but that is Krampus from 2015. If you want to give me your rating out of 10, feel free. For me, middle of the road movie, though. This is kind of a, kind of a mixed bag. It is what it is. But all right, let's move on here into our next film. And now the next two movies are independent films. And, you know, I, I was going to do Desecration next, but let's let's shake it up. Let's do the movie from this year. Let's do this movie here from the year 2022. Wow, this is crazy. One of the first times ever I can remember reviewing a movie that came out in the same year as the show. That's pretty rare for me. I'm usually old school. But this is from the year 2022. This is the leech yes a devout priest welcomes a struggling couple into his house at christmas time what begins as a simple act of kindness quickly becomes the ultimate test of faith once the sanctity of his home is jeopardized yes the leech written and directed by eric pennykoff i want to make sure i get his name right here and i can give you guys a little bit of a visual uh for this kind of uh poster here and let's hope that my thing doesn't go kind of blurry again but yes, this is the leech. I love the the old school Christmas colors here. Of course, red and red and green. Now this was an interesting watch for me. I watched this for the first time just a couple nights ago, and I was sort of blown away by this movie. And you know, in a time where, like I said, the killer Santa movies are kind of going around, and the the you know Christmas Bloody Christmas and the mean one, and let's see fucking people get mutilated. That, that's the kind of Christmas movies horror wise that at least comes out nowadays at least that's what it feels like like all of them are trying to do this is one that does something completely different i really liked what it did different now um see this keeps making my camera blurry i'm sorry about this ladies and gents this is so annoying um i guess we'll do this and we, we won't do any more screen sharing after this um of course it stars the film stars jeremy gardner who i'm a huge fan of people remember from the film the battery and tex montana will survive and after midnight i love jeremy gardner as an actor i think he's just a wonderful wonderful talent and it stars him as this homeless man who is you know down in his luck and he one day stumbles upon this church and he decides hey this looks empty i'm going to take a, a nice little nap in one of the pews and then of course we're introduced to uh the lead character played by i want to get his name right here i think his name is skipper i wanted to get his name uh i'm gonna have to go back to get his name hold on his name is graham skipper sorry about that graham skipper is his name and he is this priest who is, you know, preaching the gospel and preaching all that is good in the world and all that, you know, old school religious stuff. 
And basically Jeremy Garner says, Hey man, you, you're preaching all this good. You know, would you mind if I stayed with you? I'm a homeless man. I'm down on my luck and I need a place to sleep. I'm sick of sleeping under cold bridges and I'm sick of sleeping outside and I'm freezing my balls off. And, you know, would you mind if I say, if I stayed with you? And of course the priest at first is like, well, you know, I don't really want to do this. I don't really want to take you in. But he, because he's a priest, and I'm going to try to keep, you know, never, never mind this, because I'm just trying to fix this nonsense. It's so stupid. Um, he says, hey, you know, could I stay with you? And, uh, you know, he's kind of iffy about it. But because he's a priest, come on, come into my home. You could stay with me. No problem. It doesn't seem like a big deal. Of course, then things kind of start to escalate. One night in, he's playing heavy metal music. The next night, his girlfriend comes up and unannounced, completely unannounced. They are having these wild sexual kind of episodes late in the middle of the night. And as this movie kind of plays out, things just sort of escalate on and on and on. And, you know, this is one I will say, if you're interested in seeing this, I recommend it. I have to spoil things because there's no way you can talk about this movie without spoiling things. Now, I will say this. You can see where this movie is going from the first five minutes. You know it's not going to end well. But there's a lot of twists and turns in here that I thought were quite good. And we're going to get right into them. Um, Nate said, personally, a seven for Krampus. Pretty good, bad CGI, though. Hear that. The poster for the leads looks like a 70s old classic horror poster. And that's more what the movie feels like to me. It's it's Jeremy Gardner productions are generally very like low budget. Like the battery was made for six thousand dollars. Like it's a really, really cheap movie. But that that that's one of my favorite zombie movies because it's one of those movies, again, it it takes all of the morals and and the kind of Romero tropes of if we can't get along the zombies will get us, you know, that's a lot of his movies are very low budget. This one's no exception. There's only four actors in the entire movie. Um, so, but I do recommend it. Haven't seen the leech, but that cover would not make me want to see it. Uh, willing to give it a watch. If you think it's good, I think it's good, but it's definitely an acquired taste. This is, I, like I said, this is not a, a killer Santa movie. There's not a lot of gore in this movie. This is truly a dialogue horror driven movie. It's a lot of the horrors of speaking between characters. And I'm going to get into some of the conversations, but that will spoil things. So if you want to tune me off, no problem at all. I don't take any offense. Is the leech available on any platform? Yes. I rented it for $3 on Amazon prime. It's also available on physical media from arrow video. It's like $27. I didn't do that because I first time watches. I like to just, you know, see if I like it, but I would pick it up in the future. I enjoyed it enough. Very quick movie. It's only like 80 minutes and that's before credits. So it's like an 80 minute movie. Really, really quick. But we're going to get into major spoilers here. So like I said, anyone, I've, I'll forewarn you, I'm going to spoil some stuff here. Jeremy Gardner's girlfriend comes in and it's actually played by his real life wife, which I thought was really interesting because the two kind of organically play off each other. They have these kind of Southern accents right? Where they're kind of going back and forth and talking about stuff. And at first the priest is kind of annoyed by them and they're doing these little things around the house to kind of piss him off. Like at one point uh, he's trying to record church music and Jeremy Garner's playing this loud, heavy metal music and walks in. He says, Hey man, can you turn the music off? He opens the door and Jeremy Garner's jerking off outside the window. And he's like, Oh, sorry, brother. Sorry, father. And he kind of comes up to him. He's like, Hey man, sorry. The girl was out for the evening. I was trying to crank one out. See this, I would say this, even though the two leech characters, even though they're not supposed to be liked, they, again, they had a kind of heart to them where I liked them as, as opposed to a Krampus. I liked, just, hey man, just trying to rub one out. Like I, th I thought it was, he was sincere. Like what is disgusting to do at somebody's house when you're a homeless man and they're being as kind to, you know, kind of let you in. Well, I think so. But I mean, at least the guy was honest about what he was doing. Right. I, th I thought that was quite funny, but where things really escalate, is where one night they decide to try to get the father drunk, the two leeches. Hey, let's get him drunk. You know, they sit down and they say, Hey, let's play. Never have I ever and drink. And basically they slowly, but surely start to get the father drunk. And you start getting these ideas that maybe just maybe this father slash saint is anything but that he starts admitting, of course, in the never have I ever to some pretty sick shit. And yeah, I'm a, I'll get, I mean, I could get into it, but it, it's really sick. Some of the sick, some of the stuff in this fucking movie, man, uh, really dark, dark. So I, again, I warn you, I fucking warn you, this is some dark shit. So they insinuate that this father might be 
gay at first. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Then they insinuate that he might just be a pedophile. And there's a lot wrong with that. And they're playing Never Have I Never. And it starts with Never Have I Never, you know, Never Have I Ever Had Sex With a Girl. And the father, you know, he drinks because he's he's in a relationship with God, as he says. Whatever the fuck. Then she says, Never Have I Ever Fucked a Boy. And he hesitates to drink. And it's fucking, you're like, holy shit, this sick bastard. It's never said, but it's heavily implied. I think that's really good writing and really good storytelling. As he kind of hesitates, you know, and the two of them look at him and kind of smirk a little bit. Like, yeah, we may be homeless trash, but you ain't no saint either, even though you present yourself as this saint. And that's the big thing I think that this movie was kind of trying to say. Even though on paper we look at this father and, oh, it's a nice thing what he's doing, letting these two people into his house, when in essence he's really letting evil, trash, all this nonsense into his house. But at the same time, is evil entering evil? I don't know. I mean, it really kind of keeps playing out from that way. And I thought it was really well done. Now, they get the father very drunk. And there is a crazy sexual episode that happens. And I, I, you would not believe me if I go into some of the details about that. But let's just say the three of them have a very, uh, you know, horny, crazy, sexy night, if you will, together. And, of course, the father thought it was all a dream. And, you know, a few minutes later, the next day, Jeremy Garner tells him, he's like, listen, no, that wasn't a dream, pal. Like, we we all did it together. And he's like, holy shit, well, my life is over. I'm, I'm married to God. I'm this, I'm that. And Jeremy Garner kind of sits him down and says, hey, man, think about it, though. He's like, all the stuff you confessed to us over that game, think about it. Think deep into your soul. Think about who you really are. And I like how it kind of turns the table is uh, the whole way we're kind of thinking, oh, you know, these homeless leeches, you know, these moochers, how dare they? They kind of turn the mirror on the priest and he has to look deep into his soul and question his own sins, his own morality. Does all of this religious nonsense of devoting your life to, you know, something holier than now and the New Testament and all this stuff, does that really absolve you of your sins from your past? And that's a good question to kind of post the viewer, in my opinion. I am not religious in any way, shape or form. However, I will tell you this. I believe, and this is, people aren't going to like me saying this. I kind of feel like if you were born again, you generally were a piece of shit in life the first time around. Just my opinion. I don't know, but that's kind of how I see it. And, you know, that's kind of the picture this movie paints. This guy, you know, he, he, at first when we meet him, oh, I love God and I'll, I'll have mass. I don't care who is here. I don't care how many people we have in the building. You know, I am, I am married to God and I will take these people in, even though everyone says I shouldn't because they will find their way and I will help them find God, all this stuff. You know, it, is it all nonsense? Is it all, you know, just preachy? I, I mean, it kind of depends on the viewer. It depends on who's watching. Um, and I thought that stuff was really well done here. I like the whole questioning moralities. That's that's really the horror of this movie. It's questioning one's morale. I thought that was really deep, really deep, and something different for a Christmas horror movie to kind of get into there. Not really talking about the holiday, but talking about one's morale versus the other. The ultimate leech versus the ultimate son of God, if you will, like the, the highest and lows of what on paper you would perceive to be, you know, good and evil, good and bad, nice and naughty, if you will. And it's kind of all plays out here. Let's get back a little bit of comments here. I don't mind spoilers gives me somewhat of an idea if I want to watch it or not, but I respect others who don't like spoilers. The plot of the lead sounds very similar to a Twilight Zone episode, The Howling Man. That's, I mean, well, there's no leeching though there. I don't know. I, I know what you mean a little bit, I guess. Uh, this sounds It's fucking wild. And I'm going to get into the ending because the ending is fucking even more wild. Very dialogue driven. Yes, it, the, it, it, the entire movie is dialogue driven. There's not much of a budget here. It's four actors doing their best. And I do think they all did a very good job, in my opinion. But this is an acquired taste. I can see somebody seeing this and going, I don't know how you took anything away from this. Like, I could totally see somebody saying that. I quite like the film, though. And when it gets to the finale, shit fucking goes wild and hits the fan. Um, the lead priest character, he has his mother cremated in like a jar. And the two leeches are arguing with one another about 
the one the woman is pregnant and they're arguing he's he's like oh you know it, you're not killing my kid and and she says something like what if it's his what if it's the priest's kid because we all fucked each other and he's like oh god damn it uh i'm not doing that like like you're killing my kid and they're having all these arguments and you just hear a loud vase break and the priest runs into the room and it's his mother's ashes all over the floor and it's at that moment where he's like, oh, my God, you crazy bastards. Like, that's my mother on the floor that you just broke into a million pieces. Like, holy shit. And then shit just starts going crazy batshit from there. Jeremy Gardner starts decorating a Christmas tree and then decides because the priest has disposed of all his drugs and alcohol that he is going to snort his mother's fucking ashes as cocaine. I shit you not that happens in this movie. He guys snorts it and just screams. And that's what I did as the thumbnail for this. A wild visual. I really like the movie visually towards the end, using the the, the bright reds and, and greens, you know, the very bright Christmas color lights that I always love in Christmas horror films, right? Those are the two films, the two colors you really want to use. And that's what they use in the poster. I thought that was really well done. I don't know. I, I thought that stuff was, was fucking wild. And especially when it starts getting into, you know, the, the woman and she, oh my god she's pregnant is he gonna kill her all of these things and this this movie really just gets batshit crazy at the end it to the point where i know it could probably lose some people it didn't lose me i thought it was quite good start to finish and i thought you know even though it had some very 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 taboo subject matter in there you know talking about you know morality and fucking threesomes and fucking you know the 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 whole game of never have I never. Um, I, I thought that stuff was all really well done. I thought it was stuff that it was original enough to do in a Christmas horror movie. Um, I really enjoy the leech. I highly recommend the film. Um, it's very independent. Like I said, it's not a, a movie that's going to blow a lot of skirt ups. It's not a movie with a lot of gore or a lot of action. It's very much dialogue driven, but it's 80 minutes long. So it's really not one of those movies that overstays its welcome. I think it's worth the rent personally. It's it's, I think it's good enough for you know uh to be worth the rent now i found some of the humor in this movie funny but i could see someone thinking this is really like over the like really too dark like black comedy type of fucking you know humor i found some of the shit funny in this but i think there's some people that could get offended by some of the jokes in this so i don't know it is what it is i thought it was you know way more funny than a cramp this was but that's just me maybe i have a darker sense of humor i don't know i really like this movie though the leech I'm going to come in a solid 7 out of 10. I like The Leech a lot. I think it's a pretty solid movie. Um, nothing gets you higher than your grandma's ashes. Yeah, no, fucking, it's crazy. It's a crazy scene. Like, he's he's sweeping up the, the ashes, and, you know, he's like, you know, get me the thing. And then he decides, the priest goes nuts. He's like, I'm burning all your heavy metal. I'm burning all your sex toys. You see the guy burning up a fucking black dildo. You're like, fuck, like, this is, it's fucking insane, man. Like, it's, it is a really fucking insane movie. And he's burning up all the guy's stuff. And he says, you fucking threw out my drugs. You flushed my drugs down the drain. Just look what I'm going to do. And he starts like cutting up the guy's mother's ashes. And then just takes a line, screams at him. Like, holy shit, man. Like, this is fucking crazy. Just wow. Like the, the finale of this movie just goes off the fucking rails insane. I, I thought it was quite effective. Yeah, no, it is, this is a fucking fucked up movie. But it, to me, in my opinion, in the best of ways, I really truly like um, uh, The Leech. I highly recommend. So if you want to rent that one, like I said, I, I rented for like $3 on Amazon. Granted, I had a credit. I think it's like $5 to rent. So it's brand new. I mean, it just came out a few months ago. Not too many reviews of it up. Uh, but I thought it was funny that Christmas Play Christmas is kind of getting all the, the word of mouth, all the buzz, where The Leech is getting the better reviews. It's, it's actually made by some of the same people. And in my opinion, just sounds like way more of an interesting concept on paper than a Christmas Bloody Christmas. Granted, I haven't seen Christmas Bloody Christmas, so I won't bury the film. But The Leech, I feel like even without seeing Christmas Bloody Christmas, is definitely more my cup of tea. A little different. A little bit different. And to me, that's that goes a long way when it comes to Christmas horror and horror in general. I thought that stuff was really good. But that is The Leech. Like I said, 7 out of 10. Very, very solid. Jeremy Gardner steals it. I, I just love Jeremy Gardner. I think he's great. But moving on into our final film of the evening. Yes, this is from 
the year 1999. I actually talked about this filmmaker last year on Grindy's Graveyard when I reviewed Misery and his film Horror from 2003. It's another kind of winter themed horror movie. And I want to say this because this is really sad. Um, I know this director, Mr. Dante Tomaselli, is sick with COVID slash pneumonia right now and he's in the hospital recovering. Um, from so, I will say this on a personal level, from someone who's gone through that, I went through that, had you know a pulmonary embolism, COVID almost killed me. I was in the hospital for a long time with COVID. And, you know, I just, I want to say this, this review goes out to you. This episode is is dedicated to you. Get well soon, my friend. I hope this video finds you just like my one last year did, because cool enough, uh, he sent me some autographed stuff, Mr. Tomaselli, Dante Tomaselli. Uh, I just want to say, get well soon, man. We're all pulling for you in the horror community. Uh, get well soon, because I know how how scary it can be. But you're going to be fine. Keep fighting, and I can't wait for your next movie, whenever that is. Um, but you know, last year when I reviewed horror, Dante Tomaselli somehow found the review, saw it, and then sent me this giant message on my birthday, which is like a week and a day from now. It's the 23rd. On my birthday, one of the first people to wish me a happy birthday, sent me the nicest message. Hey, I loved your engaging review of my movie. And, you know, uh, he told me the whole kind of story of the behind the scenes, all that stuff. And the guy was just very, very nice. Very, very nice. And he ended up sending me a bunch of autograph stuff. And cool enough, he sent me an autograph kind of mini poster of his movie that we're going to talk about here tonight of Desecration. Yes. And he wrote... To John from hell, Dante Tomaselli. So, Mr. Tomaselli, thank you so much for this. Uh, meant, meant the world for me that you sent this. And um, like I said, get well soon, my friend. I'm pulling for you. And I hope uh, maybe just maybe like the first review, this will, review will find you well and, and feeling better. I really do. Um, even though it is really a Christmas horror movie, but the 2010 movie Frozen is definitely a winter horror movie. You have teens stuck on a ski lift. I did that one too. It's funny. I'm running out. I've almost done all of them, man. I did Frozen. I loved Frozen. Loved 2010 Frozen. Doug Frozen, you can't help but imagine what you would do in the situation. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no. He, it, it's it's a really good movie. I, I did an episode on that and I did Orphan because those are two winter theme horror movies. So I did that. That's not too old, that one. I think that's maybe even less than a year old. Uh, oh, that's awesome, dude. You got to frame that poster. Yeah, no, he sent me not just this, but he sent me horror sign. Like It's a ton of stuff. Lobby cards, newspaper articles. The guy went all out to send me stuff. But I figured I had to show this particular one up because I'm talking about this movie tonight. I thought that was really cool. His film right here from 1999, Desecration. Yes, you will burn in hell. That's the old school uh, tagline. I guess I could do a brief plot synopsis here. Well, this one's not too brief. Desecration is a psychological chiller about a beyond the grave relationship between a teenage boy and his long dead mother. Bobby, a 16-year-old loner, has been emotionally damaged by his mother's early death and a repressive Catholic upbringing. The boy accidentally causes a nun's death, triggering a chain of supernatural events and violent mayhem that leads Bobby into hell to confront his very own mother. Powerful childhood demons are exercised and unleashed as the gates of hell open in this gripping, hallucinatory film. Yes, desecration. Wow, so this... You know, it's funny to start the show off and talk about a movie like Krampus that was made on a budget of $15 million and then look at a movie that was made for 100 times less that budget. This was made for $150,000. So multiply that by 100000 you get $15 million. So this is 100 times less the amount of money to make, you know, a psychological Christmas theme. Now, this is not like exactly Christmas theme. It just kind of happens Christmas time like it happens around christmas time type of film but this is really a, a, a like psychological acid trip type of horror film and i really am a big fan of this movie i really like desecration and i wanted to get into this one here tonight on grande's graveyard and like i said dedicated to mr tomaselli who's recovering in the hospital as we speak i first saw this um just the way you're supposed to see it i saw it late night um i believe it's one I rented back in the day at the, at the video store and I rented it and, and mainly based on the, the cover art. I loved the cover. Art. I thought this was just creepy. Right. And, and, and I believe the same guy who did the cover art for this would go on to do all the cover arts, you know, for horror, which I also have a uh, Satan's playground and the torture chamber, you know, just this kind of simple kind of hand-drawn artwork of normal nun, clown face nun, and then like demented nun on the left there. Creepy looking, almost like a whale nun, if you will. Um, I thought the cover art was great. And I saw this late night and just was absolutely creeped out by this movie and its whole kind of nightmarish feel. 
I just love the feel of this movie. It's one of those movies that feels very, very uncomfortable from start to finish. And the movie opens up with our lead, played by Danny Lopes, who would go on to be in every single Dante Tomaselli film. They're like great friends in real life. Uh, the movie opens up where his character is a little kid and he's in this kind of cage and this entire like kind of weird playroom and he's screaming for help. His grandmother runs up the steps and sees that the mother is dead lying on the ground and the kid is screaming, crying and she kind of picks him up, tries to console him. And then, you know, we get our title like, wow, like, what a way to open a film like this fucking small kid and his mother just died in front of him. And then bam, title, like, holy shit. Like it's a perfect way to open your film. And then we get, you know, this kind of nun initiation where we're at this kind of church and all of these nuns are, you know, lighting candles with one another. And the last nun played by, I think her name is uh, Christy uh, Sanford. I want to say her name is, I want to get her name right here. Um, let me scroll back up. I believe I'm right though. Uh, yeah, Christy Sanford as Sister Madeline. And she also plays the dual role. She plays the mother as well. She's like this person trying to become a nun and her candle won't light at the end of it. And she's like, what the hell? This is kind of weird. Meanwhile, Danny Lopes is outside. He's flying around a paper, uh, uh, kind of an animatronic plane. She walks out there. He's flying it around, not paying attention. And bam, it hits her right in the head. And it actually causes her to die. She gets hit right in the right spot, the temple or whatever. Bam, she just dies right there on the spot. And Danny Lopes is horrified. He's so sad. He's regretful of what he's done. And then basically on his way back home, he runs into this kind of weird teacher guy who is like suggesting that he's going to go, you know, be kicked out of the school for failing and all these things. And then basically the rest of this movie kind of plays out as this kind of nightmare where we follow Danny Lopez's character and all these crazy, horrific, hallucinatory horror sequences as we believe it's his friend that's fallen into a hole, but it's really Danny Lopes that's fallen into this hole. A similar vein to like Alice in Wonderland, where she falls into the hole and then experiences all of this crazy shit. That's basically what this movie is. He's experiencing all this craziness. So many good sequences of horror in this film, and I wanted to point a lot of them out. The first one that really jumps to mind is uh, Danny Lopes is sitting in this classroom with a bunch of people and all of a sudden he kind of turns, looks out the window and this hearse pulls up and it's Christy Sanford and she's standing there and she opens up the back of the hearse and she's kind of signaling him to come in and he gets so scared. He pisses his pants and all the kids in the classroom are laughing at him. And the teacher tells him to excuse himself. Just horrifying sequence to me, man. Just really like, damn, like that's not only is that embarrassing, that's also horrifying for that to happen to you in the middle of class, you know? And cool enough, Dante Tomaselli had said that was his kind of homage to Burnt Offerings, which is my favorite haunted house horror movie of all time. Just love that movie. There's a great sequence where there's a nun and she's looking through this room and she's going through papers and stuff and she nicks her finger on a scissor. And it's the smallest little cut and she kind of sucks off. And then she starts going through. And all of a sudden, for no reason at all, these scissors come alive and start cutting the nun from all of her limbs, her limbs, her Achilles tendon, all over her body. And it's quite shocking. It's really a gory, graphic death scene. And from what I understand at the premiere, a lot of people were found that scene to be particularly disturbing and, and really unsettling they were like damn like you really should not have gone there like massacring a fucking nun with a pair of scissors but they go there and it is really horrifying to watch as she's screaming for help and all the nuns are trying to get into the room they're trying to break down the door holy shit i mean that's a great sequence of horror in my opinion it's really good stuff there's a lot of really cool stuff done with like visuals and visual aesthetic. And what do I mean by that? There's a great scene where it's a really cool location where it's just this gate and it's swung open and, and Tomaselli kind of pushes the camera in as the gate closes. And we see these nuns kind of grabbing away at him. Really creepy, man. Real. I mean, it's just, it's very unsettling fucking film. I, I like how unsettling and uncomfortable this movie makes you feel. And to me, that's like the whole meat and potatoes of it. And I think getting at some of the deeper themes of this movie, I do think this is really a movie more about the horrors of a cursed childhood, right? Because at first we feel bad like anyone else would. It's, oh, you know, I'm a kid and my mother died in front of me. Obviously, I'm going to feel bad for the kid. But once more and more kind of keeps getting you know, realized about who the mom was and what the mom did to him, 
you start to realize that maybe the mom wasn't a very good person at all. And they have this great flashback scene where it's Christmas morning and the kid gets this present from the mom and open it. It's especially for you. And it's this giant box. And you're thinking, you know, what could it be? It's a cage for her to fucking put this kid in here and torture the kid. And that's what she did. She would chain him up every day when he come home from school and torture the shit out of her own son. And you're like, holy crap. Like this is fucking wild. Like, what a crazy bitch. And I think that's a lot of the, 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 the horror of this movie. Like I'm saying, though, it's the horrors of a repressed childhood. It's the horrors of not being loved by your parent and instead being tortured, manipulated, and haunted by said parent and their death. And then, of course, when this nun dies, who's played by the same actress, it kind of reopens those repressed feelings and issues of horror. I think that's really deep stuff. And I think Danny Lopes does a really good job in the role as this kid, this, this frightened kid. I think he does a really good job as the lead character of this movie. And I think the whole film as a whole is just really just frightening and unsettling. And there's another, I wanted to mention this sequence as well, where towards the end, um, there's this great shot where it's a blue hue and the kid is kind of looking around. It's just really like beautiful looking shot. And he kind of stumbles upon this Christmas tree. And it's this giant Christmas tree in the middle of the woods. And he kind of walks over and he sees this glowing present. It's glowing. And he's like, oh, my gosh, look at this. And he kind of goes to grab it. He grabs and, and it burns the shit out of his hands. And he's like, what the hell? And I'm like, damn, like, what a creepy scene. Like, what is the meaning of that scene? I watched the commentary with Thomas Selly and he says, this is a dream I had over and over in my life. And I finally got to put it in a movie. I don't know what it means. I don't know why the, the present cannot be opened and it burned this kid's hands. But I just thought it was terrifying. And it really is. That's, that's the thing with this movie. It's really um, not too much to be overanalyzed or overexplained. And it doesn't go there. This is truly more of a style over substance like horror movie. And I really like this particular one because the style in it is fantastic. I really like the style of this movie. Desecration. Um, speaking of nuns, have you seen Demonia by Fulci? I have. Um, and I, that's one of the movies I know that he made it towards the end of his career. And I'm not sure I, I've read mixed things. Like he wasn't happy with it or that was one of the last movies he did. I know he wasn't in good health on that movie, which is a shame, but I remember having a good time with it. Demonia rules. Yeah, no, definitely. I agree. Mateo years ago, I used to work at a Catholic school and sometimes I would work nights seeing nuns wander around a dark school at night is unsettling. Oh, I must've missed one of uh, Mateo's comments. I find nuns scary to be with. I don't know what it is. You know, I, I mean, it's weird. Like the whole church thing kind of scares me too, man. Like, it's funny. We talk about movie with a priest now movie with nuns. You know, I guess it's the unofficial, it's like a religious horror special, the same thing. Although Krampus is not really, you know, well, I guess it is a holiday. I don't know. I guess so. But I, the whole thing kind of creeps me out too. Like, right. Like it's funny for the idea on paper. It's like, oh, we're holier than now. Why are y'all wearing like black, you know? And then they get up, all oh, these kids, you know, they will always run around their Gothic t-shirts and stuff. It's like, bitch, you wear black every day. Like, come on. Like it, it's the whole thing I think is kind of creepy. Just the whole idea of it. I, I kind of agree. I don't, I don't, the whole church thing, religion, it kind of scares me too. This looks like a wild flagrata. I'll have to check it out. Love some good nunsploitation. This is, I don't even know if I call it like, there's definitely some nunsploitation in it, but man, I think this is just an acid trip nightmare and I love every sense of it. Like I just think it's really unsettling and just it's it's really cool horror sequence after really cool horror sequence. It's one of those where, like I said, the guy had 150k. He didn't have a lot of money. He initially had 30k and he was able to convince the investor to give him a little bit more and thus makes this movie. And I mean there's there's some definitely you know there's some drug influence here. There's a lot of just creepy nightmare sequences and and Thomas Ellie goes on to admit that. He says, "Listen, like a lot of this movie came from my very own nightmares that I had throughout my life." And he said even to open up to the point where yeah, the the whole kind of the repressed themes of of not feeling loved by a parent. He said that wasn't my mother, but it was my father. I kind of just changed the 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 role here instead of the father being the one that did all that. It was the mother here. Um, how he never felt close to him. And I thought that was really, it's a really personal film to him. Um, and he's a very interesting guy. I highly recommend if you are not a fan or haven't heard of Dante Tomazelli, if you watch his films and get them on physical media, watch them with the commentaries. The guy is a great, great commentary. I love his commentaries. It's just 
wonderful to listen to. He's really, really laid back, really insightful. And he kind of takes you into the world a little bit more when he's explaining some of this stuff to you. So I thought that was really cool. Uh, Mr. Dan and horror. What's up guys. What's up? Good brother, Dan. Hope all is well with you. We're, we're drinking some nog on the, on the show tonight, Mr. Dan. So Charles here, I could take another step. Charles, my friend, we're drinking some eggnog, baby. Um, Let's see. Got to take off. Midnight hour. We'll be streaming at 10 p.m. Eastern. If anyone wants to stop by later, take care, everyone. Rock on, good brother Sean. Thank you so much for checking out the show. Um, But, yeah, no, Desecration, I I think this is an excellent, excellent little horror movie. Very, you know, kind of unsettling, atmosphere, creepy, kind of nightmare fuel. I really like Dante Tomaselli's Desecration. I highly recommend this one as well. I would come in like a 7.5 to an 8 out of 10 for this one. I really like it. But like I said, ultra low budget. Very style over substance. You're not going to get much storytelling here. You're not going to get great dialogue here. It's not really that type of film. You know, it's funny. You have the the leech where I say is dialogue driven. You have this one where I feel like it's more nightmare horror driven. I would say this is the best horror in any of these three movies. This one had the best horror of the three of them for sure. And then Krampus is just kind of a mixed bag. It's kind of all over the place for me. But it's funny. That's the one with the hundred times more money than this did. And that's the one I gave the lowest rating to. So I don't know. I don't know. Maybe if that was that was hype that killed that one or what. But uh, this one right here, um, I just I always really found it creepy since the first time I saw it. I highly recommend. Um, If you are a fan of Kino Lorber, they're doing a sale right now and i believe this is really really cheap on their sale so i highly recommend you pick up desecration like i said shout out to mr tomaselli get real soon brother thank you so much for all the nice stuff you sent me last year on my birthday which like i said is only a week away again so thank you so much for that um but yeah no that is the three christmas horror movies i wanted to talk about tonight on grande's graveyard of course desecration coming in at a 7.5 to an 8 i'll say 7.5 um of course, the leech coming in at a seven, and then this uh, uh, Krampus comes in at a five out of ten. So, three Christmas horror movies, no regrets, ladies and gents. Um, I know it's a little early. We usually go on a little longer. This, if you guys wanted to talk about something really quick, we could. If not, we we can also end it. No problem at all. If if not, I'm, I'll be drinking my nog. No problem. Everybody else, I hope I hope you're all having a wonderful holiday season. And I don't know if people want to tell me what they've been watching or anything like that, but I'll drink a little nog. No worries. If if not though, we can call it a night. No problem. Oh, man. Now, that's some good fucking nog. I, I just love that nog. It's delish. Um, Going to have to check out some of his work. Awesome Ruse Grande taking off. 5 a.m. comes fast. Dude, thank you so much for checking in. I appreciate the support as always, my friend. Uh, 5 a.m. Hang in there, brother. The Christmas season cannot come soon enough for you. That's too early for work. I got 8 a.m. work. Um, AJ. AJ's in the house. I, I was just about to wrap up. Unless there's something we want to talk about, Mr. Zitro. Top three Christmas horror movies. Oh, man. That's a good one. Uh, well, shit, I have it right here. I just watched the 4K of this. Number one. I mean, number fucking one. I think this is, I love this fucking movie with a passion. Black Christmas would be number one. Number two, it's tough. Because it's, I would say number two would be Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. Just because Eric Freeman is so fucking funny in that movie. Like, that is one of it's the greatest bad performance of all time it really is like it's the troll two of performances it's the best bad performance there ever was and he sells and the thing is you get you get the best parts of the first one in the stock footage from the first one and then you get eric freeman being eric freeman i don't sleep and all the eyebrow movements and what's it you're just jerking off here, Doc. Like, he is fucking hysterical in that movie. I love Eric Freeman. I, I just think he owns that role. And, and to me, it makes Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. And then I love the finale. I, I think the whole movie is just great. It's 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 like the most entertaining of all those movies, um, especially and it's because of him. He makes that movie. I have a Silent Night, Deadly Night 2 jacket. That's how much I love that movie. And it's funny because a lot of it is just stock footage from the first. But that's the thing. Like, it takes the best. Like, you don't have to watch the first one. Just watch the second one. You get all the highlights of one plus Eric Freeman. No beating. To me, no beating it. And number three, I'd say Christmas Evil. I love Christmas Evil. I reviewed that on the show like a couple of years ago along with To All a Good Night, which is not as good. But Christmas Evil is wonderful. I love like, the scene where Brandon McGarth is humming, you know, 
Santa Claus is coming to town and losing his fucking mind. Like he's like, <laughs> like he, that is some of the scariest shit I've ever seen in a movie. And the whole way it ends where he takes off in the van into the sky, like he's fucking flying the reindeer. And it kind of asked the, the viewer, like without asking him, like, it, was he really Santa? Did he really believe it so much that he became Santa? Like, holy shit. I thought that was brilliant. I love Christmas Evil. I would say Christmas Evil at number three for sure for me. Well, how about you, though? I'd love to hear your three. Um, have you seen Mercy Christmas, Dark and Twisted Humor? I have not, but I here I can look it up. We've got some. We've, this is one of the earlier shows I've ever wrapped, so I can look this up. Let's see. Mercy Christmas. I would screen share, but I'm afraid I'm going to lose my fucking uh, focus on the camera again. Mercy Christmas from 2017. Is that the one you're talking about? Uh, TVMA. Okay. Ryan Nelson. It's on freebie. That's cool. When Michael Brisket, um, Casey O'Keefe. I have not seen this. No, I would definitely check this out. I Last year I did a commentary for a movie called uh, Secret Santa. And there's a few Secret Santas, but the, there's a really good one. The one I like, it's it's another, it's really low budget, but it's one of those movies that really goes old school with the practical gore. And it's just, it's a treat to watch. I really like it. Um, nice choices to watch the latter two films. Have you seen Bodies, Bodies, Bodies? It made me mad. I'd love to hear you rant on it. I have not seen Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. See, it's funny, man. With with new horror, it's so, like, it, it takes so much for me to just be like, oh, that's why The Leech was, uh, I was happy with The Leech. I like The Leech. From this year, my favorite was, was um, what the hell was it called? Fucking Fresh. I really liked Fresh. That was my favorite horror movie of the year. But no, I didn't see Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. I'm sure I would probably agree with you. Yes, I did. I, I was talking about it at the beginning of the show. I watched part five in its entirety on Blu-ray and I watched all the special features and I thought the special features were great, especially the interview with the actor that played Pino hearing the Mickey Rooney stories were great. Like that was the, the fact that he was like fucking with the producers and tap dancing and they were like, Mickey, we can't have you getting hurt. And the fact that he was like fucking so full of himself and he was like, this is the best movie being made in Hollywood right now. You know why? Cause I'm in it. Mickey Rooney. Like I thought that was so funny, man. I don't know. Kevin Kiermeyer coming to Toronto. Your vibe. Sorry for the topic, but I got to ask, dude, don't be sorry. This is, we could do this. I mean, next week is, I will tell you this before we even, I get to the question. Next week is going to be more of a birthday celebration. Even though my birthday is next Friday, we're going to just do like a celebration. Maybe we'll do horror trivia or Q and a or something like that. We'll just do like a, a light episode. We're not going to have a big, big topic next week. Kind of just a eggnog cheers kind of chill episode next week. So, you know, if you want to do Q and a or horror trivia again, we could do that. Uh, Kevin Kiermeyer coming to Toronto, your vibes. Um, I mean, the guy was a lifelong Tampa Bay Ray and great, great, great uh, defensive player. Always a light offensive hitter, but the guy has heart. I think the guy has a lot of heart. They also got Chris Bassett, who was just from the Mets, had a really good year. Won like he might have won 15 games. He, he had a very nice year for the Mets. Um, the guy, he's a junk thrower. Like he don't throw hard. He's very old school how he throws. He reminds me of Jamie Moyer and the way he used to pitch. Just throws junk at you. But I, I like Chris Bassett. I think that's a really big pickup for them. What the hell else did they get? Didn't they get one other? So they have Berrios now. They have Gosman now. They have Bassett now. They still got Vladdy. They got a fucking good team. Springer could stay healthy. Granted, that's been an issue. Um, I love Bichette. I love um, – they lost – what's his name? Oh, shit. What's the fucking guy's name? Teoscar Hernandez. That's a big loss. That guy's really fucking good. I think he drove in 100 runs a couple years ago. The guy's a really good baseball player. That's a big loss for them. Um Trying to think who else they have. Maybe they'll take a flyer under Michael Conforto. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know everyone else. I'm trying to think any players I missed on that fucking team. I love their catcher, Alejandro Kirk, big big guy. Love. I love, always always cheer for the fat guy. Um, I think that's. I think it's a good pickup personally. Um, granted, I think. You know, George Springer is a great outfielder. I don't know if you really need. Maybe the, I guess Kiermaier is going to play center, and and, and George Springer is going to play one of the corners. But I don't know. I, th I don't. I don't. Th I think Kevin Kiermaier is good, and you know he's going to want to play up for the Tampa Bay games, and you guys play them a lot. So I would say it's a good sign for them. I think Bassett is a good sign for them too. I think Toronto has a lot to prove because they just got fucking bounced in an embarrassing way in the playoffs. So did the Mets. I mean, we we got bounced from a team that shouldn't have beat us. So I mean, it is what it is. But I think Toronto is going to be out for blood, and I think they're going to be a force to be reckoned with. That whole division's tough, though. 
the Orioles are getting better. The Yankees are the Yankees. The Red Sox are the Red Sox. And honestly, Tampa Bay, other than this past year, have been really, really good. But even though they they made the playoffs, I mean, granted, they, they had no offense the whole year. But, you know, they're good, definitely a good managed team, even though I don't like all that analytics bullshit. Uh, to me, it's fucking overkill. Um, but, I mean, it is what it is. I don't know. I definitely, I think your Toronto Blue Jays are going to be fine, though. I think they're going to be out for a vengeance. Uh, the window for them is definitely still open. It's just a tough division. Tough league, I guess. I don't know. Um, but does anybody have anything else they want to get to here tonight? It's okay. We can wrap early. It's no big deal at all. I just figured I ask because it's since it is early. Now would be the time. But if not, we're going to, like I said, next week we're going to be party on Ghani's Graveyard, uh, celebrating the old birthday and, um, you know, doing all sorts of things, drinking eggnog. Maybe we'll play some more horror trivia or something like that. Just a light show. Maybe even a commentary. I don't know. Definitely something like very light. Then I'm going to do a big planned thing for next week's show. It's kind of a celebration. And then uh, actually cool enough, Mateo will be on the following week, the 29th. Mateo will be on for a Jallo film special. We're going to be talking three different Jallos. I won't give them away yet, but Mateo and I know what they are. So I'm super excited about that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, all right. Doesn't look like anybody has anything else. So we're going to wrap here, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me on this fun, fun episode of Grand Ace Grieve. We're talking all things Christmas horror eggnog charge to the weekend if you have not gotten your eggnog already go out and get some what are you waiting for and um come by next week when we celebrate uh oops, sorry i knocked this camera when we celebrate my birth my the day before i don't know it's gonna be the day before my birthday but we're gonna be celebrating the, my birthday next week so everybody thank you so much for watching uh thank you so much and we will catch you next time only on the graveyard too sweet peace and we'll catch you next time